best of Liberia and shows the world the truth about Liberia. We educate, elevate, and promote all things Liberia. We conduct interviews, panel discussions, debates, and more. Tune in to Focus on Liberia on Facebook and YouTube and be a part of the stories that make up the news. This is Focus on Liberia, and I am Dennis Jack. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another edition of the Liberia History Channel on Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jai, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. In tonight's edition of Focus on Liberia, the Liberia History Channel, we're going to be delving into the life, the ethnicity, the politics, the public life, and everything in between of a very important figure in our history, that's James Jenkins Dawson. J.J. Dozen, as he's commonly called in Liberia. J.J. Dozen is the one that we'll be discussing tonight. And to do this, we have our chief presenter here, Carl Family. Carl, welcome to the show. Always my pleasure. Uh, also, I want to welcome the co-presenter tonight is uh, Mr. Jibari Lam. Jibari, welcome to the Liberia History Channel. It's great to be back on. <laughs> Right, and J.J. Uh, Dawson is the man of today. Uh, as we said here on the Liberia History Channel, we're going to be every other, as, as we continue the, the presidential series, we're going to be doing the presidents one Saturday, alternating Saturday, we're going to do something else. So the right. last time, uh, we last week we spoke about Arthur Barclay, that's President Arthur Barclay, this week, we are leaving the President's show series and talking about J.J. Dawson. Carl? Yes. Welcome. Why J.J. Dawson? Let's start from there. Well, he, he was, I think, first of all, he's been uh, omitted um, from most Liberian history um, and played in such an important role uh, in defending the integrity of the country and also as a Pan-Africanist. Um, he was very influential globally, um, was a, a, a proponent of the Black, Back to Africa movement, very strong believer in that the, the idea that African people did not need outside intervention to elevate themselves out of the condition that slavery and subjugation and uh, colonialism had placed placed us in, that we had the ability to uh, uh, transcend um, all of these boundaries and barriers and ascend to our rightful uh, place, uh, you know, in the human family. And most importantly, uh, James, uh, James Jenkins Dawson was an indigenous son. He was the son of indigenous people. Um, and this is something that is always omitted, almost always omitted. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about, we've, we've discussed some of the reasons that these things are omitted throughout history. Uh, and, and, you know, Dawson was not really culturally indigenous. So we do need to point this out. Being indigenous and being culturally indigenous are not the same things. And, but he knew who he was, never denied who he was and, and made it known everywhere he went who he was. Uh, when he met with William Ferris for the very first time, who was an author, an African-American author, when he came to the States, he said to him, he asked Dawson, he said, sir, you know, because he looked so different from everyone else. He was so much taller than the other delegates and just looked and carried himself with an air, which he probably got from his father. And they asked him, which state did your people immigrate to Liberia from? And Dawson's response was, no, my people didn't immigrate to Liberia were indigenous to the land. And this was very shocking for people because you know he was so well educated and poised because of the mindset and the stereotype that people had of um, Dawson in those days uh, was, was uh, not Dawson, sorry, Native Africans in those days was that everyone was supposed to be, uh, you know, pygmy type short, you know, uh, without any, you know, uh, you know, just the stereotype that they had fed to African-Americans about what indigenous Africans look like. Uh, something similar occurred when <clears throat> Benjamin J.K. Anderson in 1868 went to Musadu and he was around 
uh, first the day Gola, then by the Madingos. As he was interacting with these people, Anderson also made a similar comment that, hey, we don't descend from these noblemen in the forest. We look more like these Lama people or the Kisi people or the Bandi people I'm interacting with. And these other people are much taller and much different from us. So Dosen does descend from that, uh, that uh, Malayan heritage of people that were around Cape Mount. But we'll get into that a little bit more. I know this is very shocking to people, but it is, it is what it is. <laughs> and that's why I, I want to set this up. Before we even begin, I want to go to Jabari. Jabari, you uh, read extensively on Labrim history. I know uh, before coming across JJ Dozen, what were you shocked when you read about JJ Dozen? And what was your uh, uh, mindset even before coming to know who this man was? Well, I knew, well, I heard the name Dosen when in Maryland County when there was a hospital. And so I started doing more research on Dosen. And I figured he was a vice president, but I thought he was the, the, the mainstream there. Oh, he's American or Liberian. He's not indigenous. It wasn't until Carl told me that he was of indigenous descent that it was, it was a shocking revelation because I never thought that he was until she showed me the evidence that he was of native parents and he was from, you know, the... Uh, indigenous ethnic groups of Liberia. Were you shocked? Why? My first impression was the mainstream narrative. So I thought originally that Henry II Wesley was the first indigenous vice president in the 1920s. And when I found out that it was both in 20 years earlier, back in 1901, then that's when I was like, oh, that narrative of Henry II Wesley being the first indigenous leader is not true. He's not even uh, the first of, of many, actually. He's just one of the stepping stones that come after uh, Dawson and others before him. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Library History Channel. This is the place where, you know, a lot of people get us, they, they, they are shocked also to learn some of their history that most of us didn't uh, know before. I went to school in Liberia up to college, and uh, there are a lot of things that I did not learn in school, in high school, and even in college. And uh, thank God for the Liberia History Channel that uh, we are learning these things. So if you are here watching, please uh, invite a friend, share the show with someone. We have some issues with Facebook restricting our feed, so uh, we don't, our feeds don't appear to other people. They don't get the notification. So please uh, share, invite someone, and let's get started with J.J. Dozen. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting because most people think that Talbert actually was the first. Most people don't even know that James Wesley was, was, was Grable either. Most people think that Talbert was the first to appoint an indigenous vice president um, in, in 1972. So... You know, the fact that you even knew about James T. Wesley is, is amazing and it's more than most. <laughs> so <laughs> that that's because uh, the common narrative is that there was never anyone. Uh, in fact, the, the common narrative is that we didn't even go to school um, until until, you know, much later than than the evidence shows. People always look at their individual circumstances and judge the past based on their, their own personal experience, which is, um, it can skew things a bit. So we're gonna start with the slides. Um, Dennis, do you have any questions before we move on with this? No, I, I, I just wanna go into this. I mean, I, I'm so thirsty for <laughs> on James, Jake Jenkins Dawson. I had a, a, a friend we're all in Guinea. He's Jerome Dawson. So the first thing I thought was, he's from Maryland, that's where we have the JJ Dawson Hospital. So all yeah. these things I'm eager to hear more. So let's get started. Yeah. So he was absolutely born in Cape Palmas, um, in uh, uh, Cape Palmas in Maryland. Uh, in uh, so give me one second here. Let me pull up my slides so we make sure we're on the same page. Okay. So he was born, he, he's basically, he was the 16th vice president and the eighth chief justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he served as vice president from 1906 um, to 1912. And in 1913, he was appointed to the Supreme Court. Um, I'm sorry, not the Supreme Court. He was nominated as chief justice by President Howard, who was also his uh, opponent in the, the, the election where Howard defeated him. Howard defeated him and later appointed him 
uh, as the Chief Justice when Justice Roberts died in, in 1913, or nominated him as the Chief Justice when Justice Roberts died. So, Jabari, you want to do the next slide? or? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, yes, so Dosen was, his parents were of Episcopal teachers and evangelists from the Gola Bay country. So his parents, even though he was born in Cape Mount, um, in Cape Palmas, it was speculated his parents come from Cape Mount, where in Northern Liberia, because his family was originally uh, Muslim. Originally, uh, he comes from Muslim origins. And then eventually he averts to Christianity and that's the faith that he's going to take on. It's something that's very similar for a lot of indigenous people in that community. They would be Christianized, baptized, and they would end up um, sort of staying in that lane. So again, he was uh, appointed as an associate justice of the Supreme Court in 1896 by President William B. Coleman. He compiled the court's decision for publications in 1910. He served as president of Liberia's college in 1913 to 1914. He was the 16th vice president of Liberia in office from January 1st, 1906 until January 1st, 1912. And then of course he was the chief justice uh, of, of the Supreme Court of Liberia for 13 years, nominated by President Howard in 1912. And we're gonna go into that as well because there's some interesting things. That should actually say 1913, my bad. <laughs> Howard was was president in 1912. It was when Roberts died in 1913. So that's a typo. Sorry about that. All right. And, and this uh, V E Y is V. That's what today we know has V. Yes. So I just want to yes. point that out to our people. And I don't so know from I so from Gola Vey country. Um, uh, so this is Western Liberia. You know the western edge of Liberia near the Sierra Leone border. Everybody knows that's Cape Mount, Bomi area. So one of his parents um, was, was his father was uh, a Muslim, his grandfather, I'm sorry, and his father was a young child who was sent to the, the, uh, to the Episcopal school to learn how to read and write English, more so than to convert. So the idea being that a lot of these Muslim powerful traders, very wealthy traders, would send their children to these schools so that they could learn the language and be enlightened because they were really into enlightenment. It's not that they didn't have their own schools. These people could read and write Arabic. Most of these distance traders, especially the very wealthy and powerful ones, um, could read Arabic and write Arabic and wanted their children to also go to Islamic schools. But now there was opportunities for them to enlighten themselves in a different language. And so they didn't see anything wrong with sending their children there. They didn't realize the children a lot of times would convert and never return. This happened a lot. And even much later on, you see the same thing happening with Bishop Gardiner, who was also Vi from Cape Mount, um, went to the church sent by his, his father, who was very powerful, to go to school and then decided to become a Christian and never look back. Became the first African uh, indigenous bishop, is uh, Bishop Gardiner, no relation to President Gardiner, of course. So this was a common thing. Uh, so Dosen's father and mother were both educated. One of the beautiful things about the, the, the Episcopal Church is that they actively, and also the Baptist and Methodist and most of these Christian schools, one of the beautiful things that they did is they actively educated girls and boys alike. You don't see this happening really outside of Liberia in West Africa. It was very rare, for example, in Guinea or Ivory Coast for girls to go to mission schools. But in Liberia, it was very common. So little girls and little boys, both native and uh, uh, repatriated and uh, recaptured, uh, were all going to school regardless of gender, which is powerful. Uh, what I have noticed with the education is that most of the young girls who were going to school were typically runaways, uh, children who were serving in servitude capacities that would escape and seek refuge in the missions, unfortunately. Um, a lot of times the boys would be the same, but many of the boys were also the sons of very powerful people. So Dosen's father would have had this kind of air about him as well. And this is probably where Dosen got it from, the way he carried himself. I want it to be very detailed so we understand. Next slide, please. So basically, um, this is a quote from William Ferris. Um, 
Jabari, uh, you can go ahead and uh, take a look. I mean, uh, Dennis, I think Dennis used to read. But this is a quote from William Ferris. He published this in his book in 1913. Dennis? And he said, Vice President Dosen was born and bred in Africa of native parents. Standing over six feet in height, has erect as an Indian, with the bearing of a prince, the majestic tread of a king, and the grace of a French count, this native African with his brown complexion and strong face looked more like an Egyptian king than an African Negro. So, you know, this is loaded with a bunch of stuff, right? So you can see the perception in that time period of what indigenous Africans look like and carry themselves. They're thinking, you know, pygmies in the forest, you know, indignant and savage. And here is this person saying, no, you know, he had to tell Ferris, no, sir, I'm, 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 you know, I'm indigenous to the land. I, my, my people did not come from elsewhere. Um, this is actually a photograph of, of, of uh, William H. Ferris, not Dosen, just so that we're, just so that we're clear there. But I just wanted to, you know, point this out um, that people were always taken. There's another example of of, of Dosen uh, with former President uh, uh, Gibson went to the United States. And Gibson spoke, and when Dawson spoke, he overshadowed the former president. I mean, he was so, uh, uh, he was described as being extremely uh, gifted, a gifted orator. So this man was not, Dawson was not an ordinary man by any stretch of the imagination. And when he was vice president, he was basically a co-president of Barclay. Barclay relied on him to make decisions, but as smart as Barclay was, Barclay was, was not insecure. Barclay had no problem with having another genius, another brilliant mind as his, as his, as his co-leader. And so Dosen historically was the most powerful vice president we have ever had. Power meaning had more influence and control of the direction of the state than any vice president before him or after him. So Dawson also, um, most of you may know or may not know, he was married. So he was an Episcopal, uh, um, he was he was Episcopalian, he was from uh, Cape Palmas. Um, and his uh, wife was the daughter of Bishop Samuel D. Ferguson. This is important. Ferguson was extremely powerful and influential not only in Liberia, but globally. This man was respected. He was African-American, but Bishop Ferguson was respected. I mean, he was very, very influential and he would have been a mentor to Dawson. And his son and Dawson were best friends. And then he marries Dawson, I mean, uh, Bishop Ferguson's daughter. So this places Dawson in a position beyond his natural gifts and abilities. It puts him in a position of power, being married into this family. He had a brother, uh, S. J. Dose, Samuel J. Dawson, who was a school teacher and remained a school teacher all his life. But James J. Dawson becomes one of the greatest leaders in Liberian history and eventually rises to the position of chief justice, leading an entire branch of government. Some speculate these doors and avenues may have been opened for him because of his father-in-law and his influence and the respect that he commanded um, among, among the, the powerful people in the country. Hmm. Carl, as you, as you describing his power and the influence uh, he was a co-president, perhaps the most uh, powerful uh, vice president before and after. But why is it that uh, little is known of him in Liberia? Little is known about a lot of things in Liberia. Uh, we, you brilliantly have explained to me that beyond learning the names of presidents, they don't teach people much anything else about them. I mean, you've had 
presidential candidates that couldn't remember presidents who existed before they were born on your show and interviewed them. So it, it's not strange. Um, what I do believe is that Liberian history has been deliberately suppressed, buried, and been replaced by a almost buffoonish narrative a simplistic and buffoonish narrative that has taken hold of every uh, uh, vehicle it can, whether it be print media, you know, books, uh, social media, it is all over the place. So the actual story of Liberia, what actually happened, actual facts, actual dates, actual human beings have been suppressed and lost under this blur of the buffoonery, the buffoonish narrative that we all carry which is, oh, Black Americans came and enslaved people and they, nobody got to go to school or, or, or eat food or live their life until we had a coup in 1980. That is really, I mean, the, the joke of a, of a story that is out in the world about our country. So talking about men like Dolson contradicts this. And this is probably the reason we don't know much or most people don't know much about, about him or many other great people, like Howard that we're going to discuss next week. Thank you, and uh, I have uh, uh, my friend, uh, Elder Joseph Kokro is watching from New Jersey, and he's an elder. So, uh, Mr. Kokro, please uh, comment if you knew anything about J.J. Dawson, and if not, why? Give us some ideas as to why we uh, sometimes don't know much about these people. Next slide. So this is when uh, Chief Justice Roberts was still alive and Dawson, this picture was taken in 1907. You see Dawson sitting in the far left and uh, Zachariah Roberts in the center. He was the Chief Justice that Dawson replaced in 1913. And then Robert B. Richards, uh, Richardson is the, was the, others, uh, the other Associate Justice. So we had, again, we had shown a previous photo of three uh, on the last episode when we were discussing Barkley, the three uh, Supreme Court justices, I mean, the three, yeah, Supreme Court justices under Barkley, this is now the three Supreme Court justices um, when Dawson is an associate justice in 1907. And it's just powerful to show that two of them remain, one had died and Dawson replaced him. And then later on, when, when uh, Justice Rob, Chief Justice Roberts dies, Howard elects uh, or nominates Dawson to replace him. But I just uh, adore how regal they all look. If you see, Dawson is always the tallest man in the right. room, even when seated. And, and look he at his looks poster. Very, yeah, looks very uh, um, different from from others. Right. It, it, his posture remind, reminds me about myself when I'm conducting the show. <laughs> I call it catch it. <laughs> he said, he said I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is a... Uh, so, yeah, this was supposed to have... Um, it, it omitted something. So basically, this was going to be talking about some of the things that he did while... And that's the vice script in the background. If anyone's curious about what the scribbling is, that's vice script, um, the original um, handwritten vice script from the 19th century. But Dawson made traditional or, or uh, common law, native law, a priority for the government to recognize indigenous law. He incorporated a lot of this into his rulings and, and, and felt that the government and, and many of the opinions he wrote um, were in favor of native common law. So there was a case where an America Liberian or a so-called America Liberian, a, a repat descendant of a repatriated African American, took an indigenous woman from an indigenous man as his wife. And the indigenous man took the man to court. It ended up all the way to the Supreme Court. And the argument was, I'm married to this woman, even though I didn't marry her in church, she is my wife. And this man has taken my wife. It was a young, the man was much older and the woman was much younger. And the person who took the much younger woman as a wife, as a Christian wife, was around the woman's age. So she was very happy probably to leave this very elderly man and go marry someone of her generation. But he took them to court. And 
Justice Jos Dosen, his he his uh, um, opinion, which then became the ruling, was, hey, if you are going to take a wife from an indigenous person who married her in the traditional way, you must pay the man dowry back to him. So the 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 American or descendant of the American gentleman uh, had to then pay dowry to the indigenous man for his wife. And so I'm telling that story just to illustrate Dolson's respect for the traditions. Though so he was a Christian and, and believed that marriage was something that should occur in church, uh, he recognized and forced the law to recognize the traditional marriage. It is because of that to this day that we still recognize our traditional marriages as marriages. This dates back to Dolson and his influence. Before this, the courts didn't really recognize within the controlled areas of Liberia, traditional weddings. You had to be married either in church or through a mosque. But if you were married, you know, in the traditional African sense, it wasn't considered a wedding. Hmm. So Dosen pushed, I mean, that's just one example. I mean, he, he did a lot of these, these types of rulings. So we're gonna quote quickly, um, we're gonna try to keep the slideshow in the presentation as short as possible so that we can have calls. Um, Dosen and um, in the Pan-African, uh, Dosen the Pan-Africanist and ally to Marcus Garvey. So JJ Dosen was not only a UNIA uh, member, he was also a close ally and fought with tooth and nail to the very, his very last breath to make the, the Marcus Garvey UNIA back to Africa movement a reality and to make sure that they had a soft landing in Liberia. You're gonna see that it's not until Dosen dies that this whole thing falls apart. Mm. Did you have any questions on that before we go to the next slide? Yeah, but in, in how did he really demonstrate that that uh, he was a Pan Africanist and allied to uh, Gavi? And what were some of the things that he did? So when when Dolson went to the United States, he called for, and this is outrageous. He said, "Hey, we have." space for 600,000 <laughs> people to come back to Liberia. Skilled people, we will open the floodgates. Come home, let's build the country. They, we, need, we need teachers, we need doctors, we need you know clergymen. And Dosen's mind was, the really important thing about Dosen is he was one of the earliest native African Pan-Africanists. That sounds so outrageous, but we're going to see in a, on, a, on a, a, a subsequent slide what Pan-Africanism really is and where it came from. But because of Dosen's upbringing, I think he was more, um, his mind was more about unity and drawing all Black people together. Uh, growing up under the, the Episcopal Church, um, thinking people like, like Ferguson influencing him, his own brilliance and his own knowledge of Liberian history. Dosen wrote, he was a, a great writer. He wrote a whole essay on the history of Liberia. And one of the things that he consistently told people and consistently wrote was that the Pan-Africanist, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> something, sorry. <laughs> the, one of the things he consistently wrote was that the Pan-African, I'm sorry, was that the, the uh, repatriated Africans, when they came to the coast, that they came and landed on slave barracoons. And we talk about this all the time on the History Channel. Well, Dosen was telling people this in at the turn of the, the, the 19th century. I mean, the turn of the 20th century. He was telling people in 1906, 1907, that when people came, and where did he learn this from? Oral history from his own father. We were slave traders. We did these things. <clears throat> and these were this was the condition that these people came and landed on. And he talked about how even at, at Cape Maserata, which is now Monrovia, 
was a slave factory. He talked about Robertsport. And we all have gone over this with the History Channel. So Dawson was very conscious of the fact that people who had been sold into slavery were, were sold unjustly and deserved to have a pathway to return home. This was his message everywhere he went. <clears throat> and their, their time and their efforts in these other countries, what they have learned, let them come back with to open arms and help us to develop and reconcile and unite. This was Dosen's message. And it was an extremely dangerous message for an African man to have at a time when Europe controlled all of Africa, except Liberia and Ethiopia. Thank you. So while we are still in the beginning, uh, Theodore Hodge, also from Maryland, said the Episcopal High School in Harper is named after Bishop Sam Ferguson. Though he was African-American, he went to Liberia with his mother at a very early age, less than 10 years of age, perhaps much younger. So basically, he was a Liberian bred through Mary Lennon. Jimmy Eastburn adding, there was also a J.J. Dawson, Attorney General, early 1960s, defended Albert Port in the Library of Contempt case in 1974 with Abayomi Castell. So few people there from Maryland and the idea of one Africa to unite the thoughts and ideals of all native peoples of the dark continent belongs to the 20th century and stems naturally from the West Indies and the United States. In those two places, various groups of Africans quite separate in origin became so united in experience and so exposed to the impact of new cultures that they began to think of Africa as one idea and land. Thinkers and activists such as Alexander Cromwell, Edward Blyden, Du Bois, Michael Garvey, George Patmore, and Malcolm X have all formed part of a long tradition. So during this time, so especially at the time when Dawson is alive in the 1920s, this is when he's going to be part of the UNIA. So the UNIA is re referred to as the Universal Negro Improvement Association. At the turn of the 1920s, when the Declaration of the Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World, that's a document that the UNIA proposed, the UNIA is going to have the largest Black movement ever in history. We're talking about the UNIA has its largest African division in Liberia. It has a large division in Cuba. It has it in Nicaragua. It has it in Brazil. The UNIA is going to merge as this center for Black self-determination. And one of the things early on from the UNIA was that connection with Liberia. That's why you had the mayor of Monrovia as well. You had Gabriel Johnson. You had Arthur Barclay. You had Daniel Howard that were all... UNIA members, as well as Dolson and a few other and a couple others that were on board with working with the UNIA to help Liberia economically. So on 19 September 1908, Leon wrote Washington from Monrovia reporting that he had just seen a letter written confidentially from London to the president of the Liberian Republic, informing him that Sir Harry Johnson of West African fame and author of A History of Liberia has been invited by President Roosevelt to come to the United States for the purpose of studying the Negro question from the American viewpoint as it relates to his immigration to Liberia. Liam knew full well that the principle of Tuskegee opposed large-scale immigration of Blacks to Liberia or to any other place for that matter. He also knew that Liberia favored immigration and was therefore concerned that President Roosevelt might agree to it. So this is one of... Oh. I, I just, I just want to say something, Dennis. Sorry, we kind of skipped ahead. So the previous quote that you read was actually a quote from W.B. Du Bois. Du Bois. So I just think that's important because it's in quotations, but the name wasn't there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So in this situation, so in this situation, there has always been at this time, there's always been a movement of what what to do with with the African American population. It was known as the Negro question. And just a decade earlier, they had proposed a bill to help African Americans get funding if they left this out. This was just a decade earlier. Uh, Blyden comes to America. He speaks, try to convince them to pass this bill to help African Americans get funds to go back to Africa. So in this particular situation in 1908, you have Harry Johnstone, who people quote, but he's he does a great job on documenting Liberia, but the frame of reference that he goes from is very white supremacist. It's very social Darwinistic. So be aware of quoting Johnstone. He is not somebody who was had Liberia at his heart. He's the one that's quoting people as mulattoes. He's economically hitting them. So Johnstone is not this good person. So when President Roosevelt is speaking to him, of course, Tuskegee is opposed to large scale immigration. The primary reason for that is there's always been, and it's important to, in terms of framing, those who favored immigration, but it wanted to be voluntarily versus forced deportation. So in this particular situation, Tuskegee doesn't want large scale immigration because it's a a self-help sort of mentality. So when we look at those conflicts that's happening with the immigration, Liberia needing immigration, obviously, because it wants a base, but Tuskegee doesn't want to because they feel that Black people should stay in America and uplift themselves and that they have a right to. So it's it's important to understand in that context why Tuskegee's opposed to it, but John Stone may be advocating for it. And of course, Liberia's advocating for it. Right. So... It's important to also understand that Lyons was one of the people who betrayed and helped to sabotage the movement. Uh, Harry Hamilton Johnson, not only was he a economic hitman, he also helped to, uh, he was he was an imperialist. He was, he was a, a staunch supporter of European imperialism. So everywhere he went, he helped to take, for example, the Ugandan protectorate and make sure it became completely a colony. They completely lost any hope of sovereignty because of Harry Emerson Johnson. He's credited with going in there and giving the British the intelligence they needed to crush any possible resistance to colonialism in Uganda as well. So he was a horrible human being and an enemy to Africa. And then really quick before you go to the next slide, I just wanted to point out, um, so uh, James uh, Dawson Richardson is not James J.J. Dawson, Mr. Eastman. It's completely different. Uh, James Dawson Richardson was attorney general in in the 1960s. And he was Mr. He was he was uh, attorney general Richardson. His name just happened to be James Dawson Richardson. Okay, that's uh, for Mr. Eastman. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that before I forgot. I don't want us to give wrong information to the public. Buoyed by the prospect of going to Liberia and by discussions with both American and foreign diplomats, Washington was hopeful about Liberia's future. On January 7, 1909, he wrote Liberia Vice President Dawson a long letter recounting the many discussions he had 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 with Ambassador Price and Sir Harry Johnston and reiterating that those gentlemen have no wish to do anything to disturb the integrity and independence of Liberia. Nevertheless, he warned the Vice President that Bryce and Johnston may not speak of nor know about the designs of those higher in authority than they are. He advised those in to keep him informed as speedily as possible. Just what further demands England has made upon your country and what you think I can do in order, it ends there. Call you, yeah. Dennis Keever, someone in the back keeps muting me. (laughs) So um, I wanted us to stop at the quotations, but that's fine. There's a lot of U.S. intelligence 
and a lot of infiltration and a lot of spinning and a lot of uh, divisive politics going on at this point. So what they're doing is they need to thwart this effort. They need to thwart this effort and they need to do so. And there, there's a lot of people of African descent voluntarily and willing to help the imperialists sabotage the future of their own children. It is the most pathetic thing. Mm -hmm. It is the most pathetic thing. There are, they, they don't have, there's, there's no shortage of people of African descent in Africa and outside of Africa who are willing to work with imperialists against the interests of their own descendants. Much of the reason African people are still in a position of being the blight of humanity is because there were, there were too many people willing to advance. Our own forefathers were too many of them were willing to advance the cause of European imperialist conquest of Africa. And anytime someone would stand up to try to defend us, there were too many of us willing to help to destroy that person or that movement. And mm -hmm. this is what this is an example of. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, they didn't even have to compensate people to conduct themselves this way. They just would just up out of whatever natural desire some people have for self-sabotage, they would just up and volunteer. And a lot of it was personal. You had brilliant, brilliant people like W.B. Du Bois, who, because of a personal issue with Marcus Garvey, was willing to sabotage and even discredit all of the good he had done to this point, just so that Garvey couldn't be the guy. I mean, and the, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. So Dawson is in Liberia. He has a solid network of Pan-Africanists around him. Arthur Barkley, uh, uh, F.E.R. Johnson, the grandson of Elijah Johnson. He has, so he thought at the time, um, Howard and Barkley, he thought at one point, right? So Dawson becomes the center of the rejuvenation of the spirit of Elijah Johnson and Hillary Teague. Now you have this native son in J.J. Dawson who is now carrying this torch of what Liberia is supposed to be. And the big boys in Monrovia are behind him, so it seems, because they are going to the Pan-African Conference. F.E.R. Johnson goes to the Pan-African Conference because Barclay sends them in 1900 at the suggestion of, 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 of Dawson. And you've got all of this activity and Liberian power, the power structure has formed a united front in support of Garvey. But you have the, the manipulation occurring in, um, on every level. And by the way, these uh, excerpts from the book are from uh, the African-Americans and the US policy towards Africa, 1850 to 1824. Um, in in by Skinner by Elliot Skinner who was a genius. Most of what I know about Dawson's politics I learned from Elliot Skinner, who was uh, an African American a scholar, anthropologist, and historian. So that's that's the book. Plug the book. Get that book. It, it it'll blow your mind. And that's why when people say, "Oh, we didn't write our own, own history," it's not true. Elliot Skinner wrote history. These people were authors. Nowhere to find the books. But um, next slide, please. Unless you have questions on that one. No, it's good. Okay. So Washington found himself quoted by some blacks who had despaired that anything could be done in or for Liberia. One such person was Henry Francis Downing, who had served as a US consul in West Africa in 1887 and who was indicated as indicated above has since then lived in London, had attended Henry Sylvester Williams' Pan-African Conference in 1900, and had closely followed West African affairs. 
Donny wrote to Washington criticizing the Liberians, especially Vice President James Jenkins Dawson and the envoy who had visited London on their way home from the United States. He asked the Tuskegeean to place his views before Secretary of State Root and the President. Yeah, so the the Washington they're talking about, by the way, is Booker T. Washington, that the school in Kakata uh, was named in honor of. So this the, Booker T. Washington is basically, as Jabari likes to say, on the fence. <laughs> he's really not, a, he's not in the position, he doesn't have the will or the mind to sabotage Garvey. He wants to do the right things, but he also doesn't want to get killed. He doesn't want to die. So it's what we call the it's called respectability politics. He's on that fence where it's like I want to help you out, but at the same time, you know, let's try. I gotta, to I gotta live. You know, <laughs> I gotta live. I'm not trying to end up a mysterious death somewhere. And guess what? All of them are dead anyway. All of them died. They're not here anymore. So I don't know what this irrational fear of death is. Everybody's gonna go, but mm -hmm. here's these guys sabotaging their descendants because they're afraid that something's going to happen to them. And, and the winners of world history, the winners in world history are not cowards. The winners in world history will sacrifice themselves for future generations. And that's why, it, it, you know, this is what they do. If you look at European imperialists, you look at Napoleon, you look at all these people, they risk everything for their future generations. You look at Mao Zedong in China, you look at the whole revolution, anywhere people risk themselves for the future generations. Here we have a man, a very African man, a very black man, here he is, Mr. Downing, sabotaging Dosen, volunteering himself, marking Dosen for the US government and others to survey and make sure that he's taken out. He's mm -hmm. making them understand that Dosen is an obstacle to any progress that the United States wants to have with the economic annexation of Liberia through Firestone and other possible mineral companies that will come in the future. Dosen, according to Downing, who's there looking, just like he came from Ganta or, or Memba somewhere, Memba, I mean somewhere, he's sitting there telling these imperialists, Dosen is a dangerous guy. If you want to advance the cause of conquering Africa for good, get rid of Dosen. How is that benefiting Downing? I don't understand the rationale. And understand, and understand it's all, it, most importantly, this is not always the case, but mostly that opposition and that sabotage is coming from higher up positions of leadership. If we look at Garvey and how he sabotaged, it is high ranking officials like W.E.B. Du Bois, like the NAACP leaders that are having these Garvey must go. They're collaborating with the FBI. It's the same thing that's happening with those who, just, who oppose immigration. It's not the average person. It's not the average person is excited. There's Liberia yes. fever around this time. And you got the respectability leaders that are sabotaging and saying, well, why y'all trying to go to Africa? There's fever all over the place. They can't take care of themselves. And who has the largest microphones at the time? It's yeah. Washington and Dubois. So their thoughts are getting permeated and the people, the actual people on the ground is not getting filtered. That's why yeah. today, when we talk about the Back to Africa movement, it's always in the frame of, oh, well, the majority of Black people didn't want to go back because Black leaders spoke. No, those were the Black leaders that had the microphone and were, we could say, highly skilled and educated. It wasn't the right. average everyday people. Exactly. Good, good, good point. Because even today, you, you, um, I'm not saying the same thing happened, but those same kind of narrative exists about this, or um, I would say, perceived your know, division between African immigrants and African Americans. So you, you, you always have that because 
it said bad news travel faster. So those things will, will, will kind of take root very quickly because powerful people are saying it. Mm -hmm. In the next slide, the, the same person. <laughs> One can envision perhaps a counter historical Gavi, the leader of an organization stressing Christian proselytization, proselytization and white support. Perhaps he could have initially renounced the title of provisional president of Africa. Fascinatingly, Du Bois essentially proposed this scheme in 1922. As the Black Star Line's frontier seems to be ebbing, Du Bois wrote the American Secretary of State to suggest that a government take it over. The professor suggested small company in which colored people had representation to open up direct trade between Liberia and the United States. The government owned ships and Du Bois requested to know if there was any legal way for them to be diverted to linking the United States and Liberia. Such an undertaking will restore the faith of the mass of American Negroes in commercial enterprise with Africa, possibly having a private company headed by men of highest integrity both white and color, to take up and hold in trust the Black Star Line certificates. Du Bois appeal prove future. So do you see how much of a snake this man ended up being? Because he wanted to be Garvey, but he didn't want to be Garvey, pro-Africa Garvey. He wanted to be, he wanted to take over Garvey's movie. He wanted to galvanize the U.S. government so he could seize Garvey's empire, really, he and his white sponsors, so that they could be the economic beneficiaries. He's talking about men of highest integrity. He's talking about himself and his European supporters because they saw how much money Africans in the diaspora and Africans in Liberia stood to make and how much financial benefit it would be if Africans were trading directly with each other as opposed to going, everything has to pass through Europe. To this day, as we speak, we don't trade with one another. Everything has to go through Europe or America. Mm -hmm. Only 18 And we still do America. not trade with one another. Mm -hmm. And this is something that they, because the, the trade that we would have been benefiting from now, American and European companies are benefiting from getting billions of dollars when that those billions of dollars could have been going to West Africa and West African business people and West African children could be going to the best schools in the world. You know, West Africa could look like how, you know, the developed parts of Asia look, but instead we have children going to school without electricity and running water and proper sanitation and proper everything because men like this made decisions about their own selfish greed. And what is the Black Star Line? So This was Marcus. Go ahead. So the go Black ahead. Star Line was Marcus Garvey's, uh, the UNIA ship. The basic premise of the Black Star Line was Black people were going to put money into this Black Star Line. And this Star Line is going to immigrate Black people to Liberia. It's going to be a, that direct linkage. You get on the Black Star Line, you're going to set up in Liberia, and it's going to be basically like a commercial transit system. It, it's, con it's connecting African Americans in Liberia going back and not, forth. not only not only transporting people but also goods it was also these ships were also going to because shipping was shipping is still the number one medium of, of, of moving goods in the world right so this was going to also be black star line was also going to be moving ships of mm -hmm. goods not just people but the same thing that we talked about ej roy did and they had mm -hmm. to sabotage roy mm -hmm. here long after ej roy is dead you see garvey doing or the Black Star Line wanting to do what E.J. Roy did. E.J. Roy was able to bring people back and forth and goods back and forth. That's what the Black Star Line wanted to do. Now, mm -hmm. shipping, people who own these ships today in 2023 that carry goods between Africa and, and Europe and Africa and the United States, those people own multi-billion dollar trans transportation 
uh, 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 industries. They run multi-billion dollar transportation industries. That is what the world e economic system is based on. They're making, you know, they've got post Panamax vessels because, you know, they're big enough to be able to, to come all the way from China with so many containers. And this could have been something that African people were involved in at the turn of this, the, the 20th century. So by the 21st century today, we could have been one of the most powerful shipping regions in the world. Instead, what we have is just a ship registry and no ships. Mm -hmm. But their vision was not for a registry where other countries could register vessels, but where African people could register vessels and, and be able to control that transport port portion of the economy. We don't even have direct trade with the Caribbean or other African states because this process was, was sabotaged. Mm -hmm. uh, sabotage. No. So the boys want uh, the government to take over Gavis, He wanted uh, the government to take it over and basically give it to him and his 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 his, his European American boys to run. So take it over and give it to me. I have integrity. And yeah. understand and understand, Du Bois was also threatened because Garvey at the time of the 1920s had more membership than the NAACP. There were more black people who were members of the UNIA than the NAACP. And so they're viewing that as a threat. Oh, oh, the, the regular black masses are with him, not with us. We got to figure out a way how to get rid of him, which is how he eventually gets deported. Yes. So Du Bois is 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 you know, because of his behavior in this situation, it renders every good thing he wrote and thought and expressed before this point suspect. It makes you wonder if he was just talking the talk to convince people to follow him, but his intentions were different. And you see a lot of this trickery throughout history where the, the imperialists take their, their, their tokens, their puppets, and posture them and, and, and present them as freedom fighters and put them and dangle them in front of the, 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 the masses and say, here's your guy, here's your leader, follow him. And he's really not there to lead them anywhere but into slavery again. Mm -hmm. But it is through these people that they have continuously and consistently throughout history sabotaged African people's movement towards self-determination. And this is not strange. All Garvey, all Dolson, all these men wanted to do is what all men in the world want to do. Be self-determinant human beings. They were not trying to conquer anyone. They were not trying to enslave anyone. They only wanted to live the same human lives that other men of other colors lived. That was their only crime trying to assert their human beingness. All of this sabotage because African men wanted to assert their human beingness. It is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it's, and before we get to the next slide, because the next slides are going to add on to that, it's an unfortunate um, people who were fighting for freedom versus those who wanted to stay up in a system to people that made it abundantly clear that they do not see you as human nor want you here. And you yeah. still have people believing that somehow if they get closer to that proximity to these European imperialists, that someday they were going to recognize their humanity. They thought we were going to be running the U.S. and and these white men were going to be listening to us. And mm -hmm. to the we're still at the bottom and we're still subject to this dehumanization and inhumanity all because they wanted to be part of the establishment instead of saying go your own route and be your own person just right horrible so the next slide mm -hmm. is uh not you don't have to read this i but the next the slide after this is going to show the part of the letter that i would like you to read but you can post this um under the the comments later for those who want to read the whole letter. But this, of course, is um, Namdi Azikiwe, the first uh, president of uh, Nigeria. Yeah. And he wrote, uh, he was such a genius, wonderful. I wonder what he would think about the elections that are happening right now. <laughs> he would probably <laughs> shame. Oh. How we have digressed from these great men to just 
a clown, a parade of clowns. But Namdi Zikwe, um, uh, this was him. At the time that he wrote this letter, this is what he looked like. And just, I want everyone to realize, like, this is, he was young. Yeah. He was young. And it, it, it to kind of took me, you know, off guard when I realized, my God, these guys, you know, they, I would make these guys call me an call and look at how, you know, <laughs> and this is how, you know, important they were to the whole process of advancing African people. They did not think of, think of themselves as children. Uh, these were men. Next slide, please. So this is an excerpt from the letter that I, uh, um, this is an excerpt from the letter from the previous slide. Uh, this is, of course, Namdi Izikiwe when he was actually prime minister, um, uh, president, I'm sorry, of Nigeria. But go ahead. Dennis. He said, with reference to my dissertation work on the Republic of Liberia, I desire your version on an important topic, and I trust that you will be kind enough to enlighten me. I note that during the inauguration of former President King in 1924, you were appointed ambassador extraordinary and minister of plenipotentiary to Liberia. This has been interpreted in certain quarters to imply the alienation of the friendship which had hitherto existed between Liberia and the Universal Negro Improvement Association. You so this is a young young man writing. It's an excerpt from. You can go back to the previous slide, please. It's an excerpt from this letter. And this is what he looked like when he was writing these words. So he's trying to be very respectful. But essentially what he's doing is he's telling the boys, like, you need to say something because I've been studying you and I thought you were a good man. But people are saying that the U.S. government sent you in to sabotage Liberia. That's basically what that letter is saying. And sir, please tell me it's not true. <laughs> please tell me you did not go and sabotage Liberia. Because if you remember, this is a time when the boys in Booker T. Washington, these guys wrote, people took heed and they took notes. And Nandi's like, okay, I'm doing my PhD on Liberia and I need to understand what, what's going on here. He wrote this letter in 1932 when he was just a kid. And he's, he's saying, listen, sir, the boys, please tell me. You know, everybody's dead. Dawson's dead, Garvey's dead, everybody's gone. You're the only living witness. Please tell us what happened. Did you really, did the U.S. government really send you to sabotage Garvey? And what it looks like from the evidence I've seen is that because the boys wrote that letter suggesting that America, find, trying to see if there's a way America could take over the Black Star Line, they, they responded, you know, we have something better for you. You want to be this powerful and this rich? Go to Liberia and help us derail this movement instead. Because even if we take it over, they're still going to have the movement. So mm -hmm. we have to first derail the movement before we can crown you king. Does that not sound familiar? Go and destroy, and then we will give you the throne. It works over and over and over again in our history. This is the running theme of our stupidity, for lack of a better word. We consistently fall for the same thing. We'll it's promise gonna, you. Is what I refer to these leaders. I don't ever refer to these leaders as black leaders. I refer to them for who they are. These are chocolate covered white people. Okay. These oh are, come on. <laughs> these are chocolate covered white people. Okay. Oh and, come on. Well, we just need yeah. to call them what they are. Okay. Because nothing but, they but, are doing is for the interest of African people. It is to try to make them feel palpable to a white audience. Let's call it what it is. And, you know, we could come up with a site. I'm not a psychologist and I, you know, we could call it Stockholm syndrome. You could call it many things. I don't know what's motivating these guys to not see past their immediate selfish aims. I don't know what it is, but the, the, they constantly and consistently fall for the okie doke. Yeah. You know, it's like kill this man and you'll be president. Destroy the country. We'll make you president. Do this one. Yeah. We'll make you president. And they always yeah. fall for it. Self, you know, me. Just me. And then yeah. they always get the downside too. They do it, and then the government comes right back and gets them, <laughs> and it was all for nothing. So you did all of that for nothing. And then here's the boys now, as a very elderly man, receiving this letter from someone who looked up to him as a hero, saying, My mm -hmm. God, is it true? Is this who you actually are? He carried that letter from Nandi Ezekiel to his grave, I'm sure. 
He carried the shame and the weight of that letter to his grave. So we can go to the next slide, please. Secretary of State. Did we read this one already? This oh, is a no, this is the, this is the uh, slide we, we didn't read yet. Okay. About Donnie. Washington, okay. oh yeah, we read, we read this about uh, Boca T, Washington. Yeah. So Secretary of State Daniel Howell was nominated and has the regular Whig candidate for the presidency. Vice President Dozen was nominated by the National Union Party. The scripted campaign closed May 5, 1911. Howard was elected. Yes. So here you have in the, um, the whole, the media, everyone's going crazy because as we stated before, after G.W. Gibson, between G.W. Gibson and William V.S. Tubman, there are no descendants of African-Americans in the presidency. They're either from Barbados or they are indigenous or they are recaptured African. So between G.W. Gibson and William V.S. Tubman, you have a almost like a uh, rebuking of indigenous, I mean, I'm sorry, of, of the descendants of African-Americans being in the presidency. This is something that is very obvious, but nobody talks about it in Liberian history mm -hmm. because it doesn't fit a certain narrative. So this is a contest between a Basa man, Howard, and an indigenous Dosen who is a couple generations removed from his bi heritage, but he still is who he is. You have two descendants of indigenous people running for president. Howard has an advantage, two advantages over D Dosen. The first advantage that Howard has over Dosen is that he can speak uh, Basa, he can speak Gribble, and he can speak Kru or Kral. So he speaks Gribble, he speaks Kral, he speaks Basa. Howard, Dosen can't speak those languages, even though he's from Maryland. So Howard already has Monserrato under his belt because he's, he's like, you know, I've got Bassa, I've got Monserrato, Dosen's banking on getting support in, you know, uh, Maryland, Kapamas, and all these people. And here comes Howard to go campaign in the people native tongue. He bounces in the Southeast speaking Gable and speaking Kral, and everybody's like, oh, our son has come. And nobody wants to be bothered with Dosen. So Howard, they claim that he didn't win the election. I believe he did. There's some people that say, oh, no, the imperialists put Howard there. Dozen was a shoe. And, and, also people got to factor, and also people got to factor in uh, Daniel Howie Howard comes from a great legacy. Remember, his father, Thomas W. Howard, was well-renowned. So he already has that sort of connection in with, with Liberian national politics as well. So you got the So Thomas the Howard, Thomas Howard ran the True Whig Party. This is, show is not about Howard. We'll talk about that next week. But yes, it's an important point. Howard's father was head of the True Whig Party, and he was one that brought all of these native sons to the True Whig Party and solidified their core. So you had a majority of these uh, Basa and other people, related people, were, were controlling the True Whig Party at the time. And everyone was in favor. So Monserrata was on lockdown. He goes, he's, he's ringing the dialect getting the people who are not too versed in English rallied up to vote for him. So the other thing I want to point out, if the record's showing that this man was campaigning in these languages, obviously people could vote <laughs> because there would be no reason for him to be speaking Grable to people in the campaign if Grable people couldn't vote. And if, if, if Cloud Crowd people couldn't vote, he would do it, or Basa people couldn't vote, there'd be no reason for him to be speaking these languages in his campaign. So I just, that struck me and I said, but, if this is here and people are writing this, then how can people on the other side be saying that the people couldn't vote? It just does the way that they have turned like in history into like a buffoon show doesn't even make sense. It's a, they continuously contradict themselves. But Howard wins the election. Mm -hmm. It is my personal belief that he legitimately defeated Dosen. 
Mm -hmm. um, it, it is also my belief that the imperialist didn't want those in there because he was too radical. But regardless, even if you take that factor out, the fact that Howard could speak those languages helped him. And the fact that he was so rooted in the True Whig Party helped him. And that Dawson had to go and join a little known political party, you know, um, called the National Union Party to run for office because his own True Whig people overlooked him and focused on Howard. Right. So, if you are so watching Dawson, this, yeah, if you are Dawson watching wanted to be show, president. Mm -hmm, go ahead. If you're watching the show and you are from Maryland County and you want the name of a political party, you can go with National Union Party to resurrect Dawson. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I, hon I honestly think that, uh, anyway, that's a different show. Yeah. Um, and how was, uh, the, the week after, so we, we, we go more into that. Yes. Thank you. For, <laughs> so we got to keep moving because I want people to get calls in. So, yeah, so basically he lost. And then uh, we can go to, to the um, to the next slide. But um, this was this was an, uh, George W. Ellis wrote this in 1911. I think this was interesting about the, the whole campaign. OK, so Secretary Howard is the son of Thomas Howard, who for years was chairman of the National True Whig Party and treasurer of the Labrin Republic. Comparatively, a young man, Secretary Howard, is the natural leader of men. Frank, honest, and decisive, he may be truly described as the Mark Hanna of Labrin politics. He received his education at Labrin College and in the study and management of men. Proud of his race and country, he is, to my mind today, the strongest single factor in the Labrin Republic. He has large influence with the Aboriginals because of his ability to speak fluently in number of native tongues. And he is usually relied upon to settle the native palabas and difficulties. He is chairman of the National True Work Committee and for years has been keeping intact and commanding the great forces of his party. This is from George W. W. Ellis in 1911. So that just, you know, puts it, this was, this was, everyone wrote this. It was not just George Ellis. I mean, this is, you find this everywhere um, in commentary around 1911. So it was, it was, it was, it would have been a beautiful thing to see. And when they say it was a spirited campaign, I mean, they went hard. But anyway, he lost and then uh, just, you know, remained associate justice. But when uh, Chief Justice Roberts died, he was then nominated by his, his political rival, Howard, who was actually his friend, by the way. He and Howard were, were also Pan-Africanists. It's just Howard was not as radical as he was. Howard, we'll talk about next week, was not exactly as radical as Dawson. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think we covered this already. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so before we read the slide, I just want to set this up for you to understand. So we're going to get down to this is how Dawson dies, and this is how the movement dies essentially. Well, not dies, but goes comatose. Nothing, ideas never die. They just, you know, kind of go underground and they always come back up. Because here we are, here's Jabari speaking like his ancestors, you know. So movements don't die, they just go underground. They just go comatose for a while. And so this is leading into that and how, you know, Dosen's death and what all happened to thwart the movement. Go ahead, Dennis. Those, okay. Thus, by the time Gabe became interested in Liberia, the country had turned into a seeming protectorate of the United States. However, it was not a protectorate the Americans were willing to pay for. Between 1918 and 1922, the U.S. State Department attempted to secure an intergovernmental loan for the Black Republic. At first, this was to happen under the terms of wartime measures which allowed the extension of credits to allied nations. Although Liberia declared war on Germany in 1917, no loan has been authorized by the time of the <coughs> armistice in November of 1918. The State Department then tried to get congressional approval for the loan of $5 million. 
The effort remained unsuccessful, and the Labrin loan was defeated in the Senate in November of 1922. So this is important. What's happening here is that you have Dawson influencing Congress of Liberia, the, the lawmakers who were mostly educated planters, business people. This was a time when they were thinking people and they were all acting independent of the executive in 1922. They were not under the control of the presidency. This is a time when the legislature defended the country, even if the president was going to do the wrong thing. And this is a time when the Supreme Court defended the country, even if the legislature and the president would do the wrong thing. This is a time when our system of government worked because this, the government was occupied by people who understood the assignment that they were given by the citizens. Here you have the legislature, the unbribable legislature, the unintimidated legislature. Imagine the pressure they were under to enslave Liberia under this loan and they said, no, we're not doing it. And they figured that Dawson had something to do with this. And this is an excerpt from the Brothers and Strangers Black Zion, Black Slavery, 1914 to 1940 by Sundiata. They did the right thing. You know, this is not the Ita and Ibo Math loan where they just blind stamp it. These men said no. They protected the country. And this is the reason everybody had to die <laughs> or go, you know, so this now the, the 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 powers that be, you've got the boys over there trying to push this loan idea, trying to come up. He's going there as an economic hitman, as a political hitman. The like when Congress, the like when legislature is not going for it. So now that they change the tactics, they change tactics. Go to the next slide, please. And that's scary. Yes, they change the tactics. Gibraltar. So I have some, I have the, some people highlighted here, um, but. Uh, and Dawson is standing tall. Yes. So Gibraltar Johnson resigned as a redesign and was appointed ambassador to the Spanish colony of Canadopo. Robert Lincoln Poston Gavi's closest advisor died on a ship while returning to the USA from Liberia. Milton J. Marshall, head of the Labrin UNIA, was shot and killed by an unknown, ass unknown assailant. Chief Justice Dozen died mysteriously at his home in Cape Palmas on August 30, 1924. All these people died within weeks of each other. <laughs> um, I mean, it, so the green arrow here is pointing to Dawson, the tallest man in the room, right? The most regal man in the room. And then the other green arrow is pointing to uh, Poston, Robert Lincoln Poston. He's the one who died on the ship returning to the United States. And President Howard, who was no longer president, this is during uh, uh, Charles D.B. King's presidency that that loan was rebuked. But uh, that's former President Daniel Howard uh, with, the, the, in, with his hand in his pocket, it looks like. So that's President Howard. He looks like he's standing a little lower on the step there. And then the other yellow arrow is pointing to former President Arthur Barclay. So this is a very powerful picture. These are the power. You've got two former presidents standing with UNIA, two former presidents of Liberia standing with the UNIA delegation, a current chief justice Standing with the UNIA delegation, Charles D.B. King has already drawn a line. He knows that these people are going to die. He, the reason I have resigned under Gabriel Johnson in quotations is because Gabriel Johnson didn't really, oh, I put redesigned. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, guys. It's supposed to say resigned. resigned. <laughs> I didn't proofread the slide. It's supposed to say resigned. I'm like, what? So it's supposed to say resign. So he didn't actually resign. He was removed from his post as mayor of Monrovia, which was a very powerful role at the time, because this is the oldest capital city in Africa. 
right? So he was the mayor of, uh, of Monrovia. And this role was prestigious. He was taken from this and literally deported to a horrid place. Charles E.B. King was like, you know what? You can't kill Gabriel Johnson. This man is a descendant of, of a great man. If, if we kill him, you know, the people will have my head. There'll probably be an uprising, but I will deport him. I'll send him an assignment somewhere far away from Liberia. He puts Gabriel Johnson in the ship and sends him to Fernando Po as an ambassador, to, to this, to, 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 which is ridiculous. Far away, where he could be incommunicado, not bother anybody. And then they force him to write a letter saying that he's also no longer affiliated with, or either he was forced to write the letter or they wrote it for him, that he's no longer affiliated with UNIA and saying all these terrible things. The letter never bore his signature, but it was allegedly written by him, condemning UNIA after he's been removed from this very prestigious post as mayor and sent off to some hot, terrible, godforsaken island. That we and, all know, uh, which we all know in a few years later is going to become a, <laughs> a global catastrophe that's going to lead to his yeah. own demise. So so that's what he does. He sends a man off to Fernando Po as an ambassador. And that is how our hero, uh, James Jenkins Dawson, dies mysteriously. Um, there's all kinds of stories about how people believe that he was poisoned. People believe that he had some medication that was switched and he took the medication and died, you know, but most people at the time thought that he didn't die of natural causes. So, and what was Liberia's relationship with uh, Fernando Po that you sent ambassador there? This was a, a, French, a Spanish colony. Yeah, it, was just, it wasn't even a, 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 a ambassador to Spain, but to Fernando Po, which is just yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, what sense does that make? So I mean, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. what he did. Later on, yeah, later he on. Him off there, but uh, the the next slide is just introducing next week's show. Um, we're going to focus on uh, Daniel Edward Howard. Now, if you look uh, JJ Dawson up, you look Daniel Ho Edward Howard up. They just omit their so ethnic much. background. They don't really say that they're. If you look them up on the, the, the you know conventional sources that people look at, they just omit their backgrounds. We're going to go very deep into Daniel Edward Howard's background next week and his presidency. Daniel Edward Howard was also the one that expanded or extended Liberia's reach into the interior, all the way to the outreaches of our territory. So it's because of Daniel Howard. Um, I mean, Queen Suakoko inviting Daniel Howard to help settle the wars that were raging in the parts of Liberia that were not under the command and control of the Liberian government. It's because of that um, that, that Daniel Howard was able to, to penetrate. So please watch next week as we talk about uh, President Howard, our 16th president. And uh, the following week, we are going to discuss the uh, Firestone Slash Fernando Cole labor crisis. Oh, I can't wait to get into that. <laughs> um, one final thing. One final thing on that photo with JJ Dawson and Daniel E. Howard. There's one person that needs to be mentioned. She's the only woman there. Oh, yes. Miss Henrietta Vinton Davis. She was considered the major star, the mother of the black race at the time. That's why Garvey had her as the top major woman to lead the UNIA. She was an actor. She was a dramatist, but she was extremely proud to be black and she wanted to do anything to uplift the community. So I just want to give a shout out to Ms. Thank Henry you. Davis. So that, that closes our presentation. If we have a couple minutes for questions or comments. Oh, we have a lot of comments, but uh, thank you. Let me announce if you want to join the conversation, the number is on the screen, 605-313-6004. The code is 7914035 pound. Call that number. Some people call it, and it says uh, you have to pay one cent per minute. It's very important that you call. I promise, if you <laughs> exceed, you know, and you and you are charged thirty cents because you waited thirty minutes, please uh, let me know. I'm going to charge up you the thirty cents. But I want you to really, really be part of it. Not that I have the money. So when I connect to the same line, that's what I pay per minute, almost every day, and. We're doing this for, for Liberia. 
one of the questions here, Kyoto uh, House is asking for this book. It's asking for the book. Uh, which one of the books? The American, the African Americans and U.S. policy towards Africa. Is asking, you know, please repeat that again. So, Kyoto, when you're watching, that's the uh, that's the book. Yeah, the book is the African American U.S. policy towards Africa. That's yeah, by Elliot Skinner. So this information that we're presenting is not coming from a, a single source. This mm -hmm. is why I always, when I quote, I tell you what the book is and who's saying it and stuff like that. There's yeah, no it, compilation it, of what I'm discussing in, in one source. There should be, but there isn't. Unfortunately, you have to, you know. Right. He wants uh, to read more about Dosen. Right? But that that book is not about Dosen. It's about exactly what the title says. You, um, the African American and U.S. policy toward Africa, and I learned a lot about Dosen in the book because uh, Elliot Skinner talks very deeply about Dosen's ideas and and and, and so on. Yeah, that's his uh, fellow Marylander. So he <laughs> wants to read that. All right. So let's get to a few comments here. Um, Michael McGarry Ferguson, the founder of the Episcopalian FIP in Liberia. Theodore is uh, the local hospital in Harper is named in honor of J.J. Dozen, well known in Maryland County. Uh, his descendant, Jerome Dozen, the late, was my very good friend. And, <clears throat> In Guinea, more comments here. Uh, so wasn't the bias script eventually standardized? Okay, I, I read this before. And uh, call, call you clarify what uh, Jimmy said here about JJ Dawson. So that was a different Dawson. He was not even Dawson. Dawson was just his middle name. It's Richardson, James Dawson Richardson. All right. Um, to answer one question, the most recent question, yes, Bobby E. Wright, uh, Daniel E. Howard was indigenous. There was a labyrinth. Was Baza specifically a Baza man? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, Baza. You're, you're, you're keeping it. That's next week topic. Let them come. <laughs> so we can learn about Daniel. We can learn about Howard. Some people say, you know, anyway, I don't want to get there because Swakoko called Daniel and people are trying to say some funny things. But we'll, let's wait for, for next week. There was a Liberian commission sent to the lab, to Liberia under the Barclay Dawson administration by the Taft administration in 1909. MNJ Smith was involved. Any thoughts? Wait, what was the question? Uh, there thoughts? was a Liberian Yeah, commission. about the Liberian commission sent uh, under the Barclay Dawson administration by the Taft administration in 1909. Taft administration. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that's what they that's what they always did. They always send commissions to Liberia to go, you know, harass Liberians and to go investigate. Um they would basically they there was an issue. We talked about it last show. Please watch the last episode. There was a conflict with the British trying to overthrow the government under Barclay, and these people came in to investigate. Um that's basically it. But we go into depth about that a bit on the last episode. Mm -hmm. My understanding of history is that the settlers in Liberia, including other prominent Black Americans, specifically W.E.B. Du Bois, opposed Gavi and the UNIA. Uh, he continues before you come in. Had the Liberian leadership been open to Gavi, the movement would have been successful. He was sabotaged by American settlers because of petty jealousy, because he was Caribbean born and seen as a threat. Can you go back to the um, slide that shows the arrows, the green arrows? I think that was slide number. Um, I mean, that's just, it, it, so we can't just say things about history because that's what we think in our head. There's absolutely no evidence of this. Yeah. Garvey was sabotaged by the American government, period. That's what the evidence shows. He was, he they, in, in, in some of their minions, by the American government, European powers, the also Black European Indians. powers a little bit as well. But, uh, but mostly the American government. The yes. American government 
was the, I mean, the biggest portion of the movement was coming from the United States, black people. Those were most of the people that wanted to repatriate. The U.S. was the apex center of the Garvey movement, whether he was born in Jamaica or not. So the U.S. took the lead in the sabotaging of Garvey, used the boys and others to do so. But these men in this photo, while I understand that you're looking at a, a Bayesian and two native people or indigenous people, this time period was a time period when there were no African-American presidents. Presidents. Charles D.B. King was not a settler. Charles D.B. King was the first among all of his ancestors to leave the continent of Africa. Charles D.B. King is a descendant of recaptured Africans. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Mr. Hodge, understanding of, of ethnicity and all of this, there was no it's not like Tubman was president or Talbert was president or, you know, Stephen Allen Benson was president. The president of Liberia at this time was an African. That mm-hmm. his ancestors had never left the continent. So this is this is inaccurate. And also Charles not- isn't is it wasn't what contrary to what people say, he was not a miracle Liberian. He was not a descendant of African Americans. He's Period. from Steve, he's That's, from Sierra Leone. He's Sierra Leone, guys. He's from. He's, he's, not, he's not even from Sierra Leone. He came through Sierra Leone, Leone. from what is now Nigeria. Right. That's awesome. really what it is. He's not even. They'll say, "Oh, he's Creole." But he was not Creole. Creole people came from the Caribbean. They came from, um, you know, uh, British colonies. These people were rescued from a slave ship. They knew who they were. We'll talk about Charles E.B. King when we get to his presidency in great yeah. detail, the son of the great CTO King. Charles E.B. King, yeah. Oxford brothers, so the boy also alerted the U.S. government and helped with the fateful Firestone Agreement that still exploits our country today. And uh, we're gonna get to Firestone uh, week after next. And so we get all that. <sighs> Keita, I don't, know what went wrong in Liberia, a country. It existed when all African countries were under colonization, but still it is the most underdeveloped country in Africa. And Carl, you were talking about the voting. Theodore Hart said there were indigenous Liberians who had franchised the right to vote, but the vast majority did not. There were gribbles on the coast who had franchised, but the vast majority in the interior did not have the right. It was yeah. during the Tubman presidency that universal suffrage was granted. I wouldn't even say I wouldn't even say universal suffrage was even granted during the Tubman administration. So we have to understand we talk about this all the time. The Liberian government did not have any control at all over the hinterland. The portion of Liberia that the Liberian government controlled, anyone falling within that area was Liberian. Everyone else was autonomous. So my people in Nimba were not we weren't paying hut tax. We had never majority of us had never seen a Liberian before. Only the traders that would leave from our territory to go trade on the coast would come back and tell us stories about the funny dressing, you know, European Negroes on the coast. But at the same time, you have to understand the context in which we this is saying the vast majority didn't have suffrage is as if you're saying they were denied suffrage. They had not even been incorporated into the country. They were literally living as a sovereign body. It's not until Howard time which hasn't come yet. <laughs> We're talking about, you know, a time when Charles D.B. King and Arthur Barkley and Charles D.B. King were president. They didn't control that part of the country at all. It was after Suakoko opened up the gateway for them to penetrate and, 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 and also assert uh, physical control. And we'll talk about that in great detail next week. But history is not you know, something you can read backwards. These people were sovereign. So saying that sovereign people didn't have suffrage, why did they want suffrage? You'll find out very soon next week that we didn't even necessarily want to be Liberian yet. It's a it's an issue where there was no choice. It was either we we're going to be conquered by France, by England, or we we're going to be Liberian. And yeah, that absolutely. decision for the majority of us in the hinterland occurs during Howard's presidency. And even after uh, Tubman makes those some of those territories actual counties, there was still resistance. 
So it's not it's not like we're all sitting around waiting for somebody to give us a country. We are a country. We had countries, exactly, yeah, Dennis. We yeah, had we countries. countries. Yeah. And we yeah. had we didn't we didn't envy the people on the coast and want to be like them. We had we respected ourselves in our own ways of life. This universal right suffrage here. universal suffrage comes at a price, which is we lose our sovereignty. That's a, that's conquest that wasn't even possible until Howard and the frontier forces are developed, better developed. But Liberia was a new colonial state ever since the settler relied on U.S. military and economic aid to take control of the country. They didn't have a choice. See, this is the this is the issue when we look at history through a modern lens. Understand, back during that time, you had a choice. Either you worked or collaborated with the United States or Britain and France and Germany can come, come and just take Just divide you, you up. Just divide and, you up and, you and take over your country. <laughs> and you ain't got nothing. So I'd rather have a country and have to make those sacrifices than have nothing at all. So Absolutely. And that's the thing, the context. People act like we, listen, you're dealing with a world where Black people were not even considered human beings, let alone self-governing human beings. And we're here looking at the past and saying things, those are neo-colonial this and it wasn't even neo-colonialism. This is neo-slavery. <laughs> this is not neo-colonialism. This is the epitome of the dehumanization of our people. And this was a, a thing that was accepted universally, even by some of our own people. So to be able to even stand up and say, we have a country was, was profound. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, go Munta said, wow, Liberian wickedness started long ago. I think uh -huh. it was making reference to when uh, these people mysteriously died. And I, I don't think Liberians killed them. I think they would, you know, again, that's the, the American influence. When the boys' mission failed, people start to die. Who is the, the, the hidden hand behind these murders? You have to go back and blame, you know, the U.S. government. Because if you look at the way they operate, they infiltrate. When that doesn't work, they kill. Mm -hmm. They continue this conduct all the way into the 1970s among their own citizens. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, even. You look at what they did to the to, to, to the Black Panther Party and other movements of people trying to fight for equality and justice and the right to self-determination, what they do. If the infiltration doesn't work, we just murder. Mm -hmm. So there's a documented history of this. And during the Garvey era is when you have the first Black FBI agent, person who is in officially a position in the FBI. Yes. Massa Collie, it seems like Liberia was well respected internationally than our pariah state now. Too sad. Uh, I think I think that's an important statement. At that time, I don't think Liberia was respected. I think I don't think black people anywhere were respected, but we respected ourselves. Mm -hmm. We respected ourselves, and that's that's even more important. Bobby said, Mrs. did you say Daniel Howard was indigenous? <laughs> Why Bobby, are you reading it with all the facial expressions? <laughs> yes, I did. Yep. Yes, I did. His ancestors are, there's no record of any of them coming over on any ship. So, yes, and the Basa people. Are you may is not getting through. Please uh, try. Uh, there should be <clears> no <throat> reason. Uh, I am make. Julata Cassell, now that we know all these, what steps are we taking? Not to repeat the things <clears throat> we are committed against ourselves. So we have been living a hateful lie. Are you may please. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> My sister is passionate. <laughs> She's trying to call. I don't know why you're not getting through. Are you may. If They're blocking all the, the History Guild people from calling. No, just kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, 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 the government came and said, y'all not allowed to talk about that. So, so this is shout out to uh, to BAIO. Is that, did I say that right? Yes. And shout out to the Librarian History Guild and Save the State. All right. <clears throat> Theodore, the power base in Liberia was always predominantly American 
or African American? Yeah. Yeah. In Liberia, uh, only rise. We just wanted to summarize in a small comment. <laughs> but that's true. It's a true statement. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Bobby said, thank you for a great history lesson. Uh, even the Five Stone Agreement was signed to save Liberia from France and Britain. It continue, uh, we have always been in a hard place. Yeah. Even Thomas' brother who was renegotiating our bad conclusion agreement in the 1970s was killed in a plane crash. It's sad. He said, God know why I'm not getting through. And she is furious about that. All right. Uh, yeah, so let me check for, for colors. And Jamari, you can go ahead. I think you were saying something. Yeah, no, it was just briefly with the power base being African American. I said Liberia can't rise without it connecting with its African American population. Uh, I consider African Americans Liberians, so I said Liberia is not gonna rise without that. It's other population. All right, we we have a caller now. Go ahead, call out your name and where you calling from. Hello, Miss um, Elna Jolata Cassell, calling from Australia. Good morning. Yeah, hello. Good morning. Here is um a what? No, a one o seven in oh, the afternoon. Oh, okay. Y'all hello, my library people. Mm -hmm. And thank you, first of all, for this show and everything you people are doing. Jabari, my bossa brother, Oracola. Ibasa. Okay, thank you, this. But uh, I'm. It's it's kind of personal for me right now because. Everything that happened, everything that destroyed my life, let me talk about me, because me is every other like grown girl or like grown woman. Everything that destroyed my life, everything that changed the course of my life were based on the things that we thought was the truth. Because we were trying to justify why these things were happening. Oh, because they liberated the country. Oh, I didn't hear that in my father's house. But what the country knew, majority, was justifying the reasons why these things happen and sitting here today that i did not reach my potential like many of my mates my peers that became child soldiers my peers that died or, or, or just just name what happened to our generation especially did this all happen for nothing and we're still justified because this is very big this is very huge so did we destroy what our forefathers built on lies? I just want to understand what are we going to do to change this for the next generation so that it don't repeat itself. We can't just be talking and, and nothing. What is going to be, what, what can we do? Mm. That, that's, that's, that's a great uh, rhetorical question. What can we do? What are our next steps? In, in the first place, we provided the education. Uh, the first step is uh, let people get it, right? And then we move forward from there because um, when we were growing up, we learned education is, is the key, you know, because where there is, where people, if you don't know, you are not able to act. You are only acting on the limited information you get. So our first step is let us be able to uh, continue to watch the History Channel. And what can people do? Sometimes people call me and say, oh, Dennis, can you get it on the radio? I'm challenging you is what, if all our viewers and even those who will watch later on, what can you do to carry this message forward? Can you get us on the radio? Can you provide grants so we can do more research, so we can get more people, so we can have this in other forms, out of media to be able to put the message forward? We can start from there and challenge ourselves. So if you are here, there are people who want to, uh, we can do a whole new project to uh, redo everything, edit everything, and be able to come up with uh, audio books, be able to come up with books. How? What are we doing in Liberia and the uh, gatekeepers to get these things into our schools so that we can learn instead of just repeating 
the, uh, or reciting the names of the president, at least you can know a thing or two about the president. So Ayume, thank you for that passionate yeah, and rhetorical just, question. Yeah, what can we do? One, one little thing, what you said, sure. thank you for that, and you are so right. We all do our part. Thank you, Jabari. Thank you, all of you. Save the state. Everybody, thank you, Cole. Thank you. But that question, was it just for you? Or focus on like, bro, no, I know. No, I know. This, that, this question, let's go to the people because everybody here, somebody knows somebody that knows the guy that knows somebody. So let us start talking to those people that sit up there so that we can do something to change this thing. Because nothing happening, and this is a national issue. It's critical. So those that know the guy that know the lady that know the guy that's somewhere, we all got something to do. So let's start doing it now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jibari, continue while I, uh, I take another color. Yes. Yeah, so, I think in order for it to, what we can do is, of course, we have that boost on the ground. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to do. And I've always been trying to do for the last a couple of years. I've been trying to get to Liberia since 2018 because I can be here in the States and get all this information, but the only way that I can leave my impact is for me to actually go there. It's for me to actually be in Mon in Monrovia, be in Bone, be in Granjita, and actually giving them the information, giving them access and resources, which is why I keep my own digital library so that in case if people want to access it, I'm able to provide them those necessary materials. But I think that's really where it comes from. We've got to be those boots on the ground. We got to be the ones in Liberia communicating with people, setting up a vision, setting up a goal. Because if you were to ask the average Liberian, what is the goal for the next two to five years? It's just well, I want rice. I want I, it's a survival mentality. It's not thinking 20, 30 years on. And I think that's where, it, um, for me, is what we can do and where we can start. Thank you. Let me get one, uh, our last caller here. Call out your name and where you're calling from, please. You are live. Hey, John. Great show. Uh, call. I really appreciate you and Jabari. Uh, this has been a very, you know, knowledgeable and and just like the caller just said, no, you see, knowing your history can give you the tools to shape your future. Mm -hmm. They have for centuries used their narrative to control us, divide us, and keep us ignorant about who we really are, what we stand for, and make us not proud of ourselves. So this sort of education is what we have to give our children so they can be proud of themselves. If you remember that song, teach the children and let them lead the way. If we don't enlighten, you know, because we've got people walking around thinking, you know, with enemies and grudges and about, about things that are not even true. But they walk around like that. So this is mighty, this is powerful. I wish we could get on the radio, uh, John, or in, in Liberia, so people can hear these lectures, so they can be educated. Because really, part of keeping people down, part of ruling and, and, and dominating people, is not giving them the information they need. That's how you keep them oppressed. So uh, let's let's stretch this out, um, John. I know you're doing all your best, but this is great. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tiro Harse, great show. Thank you. And your guest, Alan Sara. We need to love one another more in our country and begin to coordinate our efforts to what we think it should be. The Constitution might be hindering our direction, so it needs that revision as well. All right. I don't think there's anything wrong with our Constitution except some of the recent amendments, but the yeah. Constitution, the Constitution, the very recent amendments are the problem. Mm -hmm. The original Constitution is, it's one of the documents I look up to, one of the documents that I admire, and I think just going back to our roots, you have to go back to where it started. You, if you want to know where you, what, how we got here, you got to know where you come from, and you got to know where it all began, and for me, that's yeah. What really is what moves it forward. We can do a show in the future, pick apart the Constitution and all the changes, right. but right now, let's move on to 915. 
Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. One, one of the things I want to mention, Dennis, I noticed that part of the the the, the narrative, the hate, anti like we're hate narrative, is always to attack the institutions. When you attack the country's constitution, you're attacking the country itself, right? The constitution is the country. Right. And what, what, what you mean you, when you attack the constitution? What does that attack mean? Attack means thinking that the constitution is the problem. Right. That the country's messed up because the constitution is messed up. So what you're saying is the country, the country, the idea of the country, right? The legal manifestation of the country is the problem. Therefore, the country is the problem. The, nobody in the United States ever says that about the U.S. Constitution. Nobody. Because the most anti-patriotic thing you can say about any country. When you condemn the Constitution, you condemn the country, you're now talking about revolution. You're now looking at non-constitutional ways of reform. Let's throw the Constitution away and start yeah. a new country is what you're saying. I, I don't think that's the... That's that is, that's what it is. And you, you, you will never hear an American say that the American Constitution is the problem. There was site specific laws. Right. This yeah, specific yeah. law is a problem. But you'll never hear people from any country say this outside of Liberia. I've never heard it from anyone. And it goes back to this whole hate Liberia narrative. What exactly is wrong with our constitution that protects us and gives us all these rights? It's not the constitution, it's not the structure of the government, it's the ignorant people who are in charge who are the instruments of the laws that do not even understand their functions that are dysfunctional and driving unconstitutional practices and illegal things. But that doesn't mean there's something wrong with the, with the, with the constitution or the laws. Right. It's the people that you're empowering to be the instrument of these laws. Right. They are the problem. So you don't wanna change the constitution, you wanna change your leaders. You want to vote for competent leaders, functioning leaders. You've got men like Dennis Job, born and raised in Liberia. If this man got up today and said, I want to be your representative, I want to represent you. Oh, that man coming from America. We're going to go vote for Color Green. We're going to go vote for our local drug dealer. I mean, this is the mindset that we have. Then you want to blame the Constitution? Blame your bad voting record. Your bad voting habits. Vote better, yeah. the country will be better. Thank, thank, thank you. And I think uh, you're just uh, saying, you know, hey, let's do something about this. Not really an attack per se. Maybe the intention is not is not that way. But I, I can understand. I hope that. not. I really yeah, hope it's not. Maybe I'm yeah. wrong, but I hear a lot of people. Yeah, I think what he was saying was, I think what he was saying, some of the current amendments in the current constitution have made things a little bit harder. Right. Like, like I hope that's what he was saying. Term okay. of office, uh, you know, all, all that. But thank yeah. you for the next four minutes. Let's uh, let's close. David Henderson, thanks for educating. Uh, Austin come back and say, oh, no, I'm not condemning the Constitution. I'm just oh, saying. Oh, good. That, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, that's what I said, like the amendments. There's Ooh, things that I, I, and, and Austin, thank you for clarifying. But most of the time when I hear that, that's what they're saying. You know, so that's why mm -hmm. I went off of that tangent. But I'm glad you clarified that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I understand. Where I speak like, I, I, you know, I understand what. what you is. speak like you're in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was in class. And I, those questions, we asked them. So I, I can I can clearly see where, where people are coming from. But thank you so much. Uh, tomorrow, around the same time, 6 o'clock, the show Hello Pastor with Reverend Chandler G. Freeman will be here. At 4 p.m., we'll have a On Point. On Point is that a show where those guys can't even agree. And then if you are traveling and you need an advisor, contact our friend Keller Benson with uh, the Bali Travel Agency, the number is there, 443-3839-7777. That's your travel advisor. Jabari, Carl, thank you so much for your time. I want to thank our viewers for also coming. Let's get uh, at least for 38 seconds each for your closing comments, starting with Jabari. I would say when we look at the story of Dosen, we look at the story of us coming together. And that's one of the things that I've tried to do since I was in high school, piecing Liberian history so that it can be one that is whole and one that is unifying. And oftentimes when we are focused on a certain aspect on 
who was represented here, who's representing there, we forget that we all play that role in there. Dawson is an example of that. We see that earlier in, in, with Tobo in the House of Representatives. All of us played a pivotal role in the development of Liberia. And when we understand that our best interest is for the country and self-determination, we don't make the mistakes that our ancestors made and we can build off of what our ancestors truly aspire to. Thank you. Carl? Yeah, so I just want to say there's not, there weren't two curriculums in school, one for elite people and one for poor people. Everybody learned the same things. And so the, everybody learned the same things, including the descendants of the repatriated African-Americans. They learned the same skewed narrative of history. They also were taught to ignore or to diminish the contribution of indigenous Liberians to the creation, the defense, and the advancement of the country. So everyone grew up with the same story. So when you, in this modern life, can hear someone say, oh, our people founded this country, we did everything, it's because they're taught the same lies that you and I were taught. You know, it, it, it's the same narrative. So that's very important when we're looking at history. It's not one person getting one story. One person. So the, the, the lie affects everyone, even the descendants of great men like Elijah Johnson are not carrying the torch of their ancestors. They're carrying the torch of an imperialist racist narrative instead, where everything is anti-African, they look down their noses at their own selves, thinking they're looking down their noses on Africa. I mean, it's pathetic. So I do want people to understand that we're not saying that people are not discriminating and hating and doing all these things. Of course they are, because they're all being taught the same anti-African narrative. And the other thing I want to point out as well is that in West Africa, generally, ethnicity is fluid. Fluidity of ethnicity is very important to understanding the context of history. Language and culture are not genetic. There's something that people learn and adopt. So as we talk about these stories and we mention that this person's grandfather was this, it doesn't mean that that person culturally and consciously is that today. Ethnicity is fluid. A person can be born one ethnicity, marry into another, and their descendants be completely different. I want everyone to always keep that in mind when we talk about ethnicity in that cultural context. Thank, thank you, uh, Anansi and Poor Man Lawyer. <laughs> Stella wants to get the song. We are all Liberian. Stella, we, you have to. The, the group that sang that song, they are there. We'll contact them so we can get them. Yeah, man, there. you really? You should say that. Do you know the name of the group? Yeah, they are the small town. How do you call that group? Small town something. Okay, we'll get it for next time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we close with that song that says we are all Liberians, right? And uh, <laughs> whether you know a little bit more about history or you know a little less, or you think J.J. Dawson was a miracle Liberian or Congo or Gribble or they, we are all Liberians. That's the song that's taken out from. Have a good night and God bless you. Good night. We are Liberians. Liberians. Ah! Uh -huh.